Good morning, church. It's Kelly uh, coming to you on Thursday morning. Oh, it's early. It's about 6.30 at my house. And uh, we've been doing this Jesus is Better, and we're at uh, Jesus is Better Part 4. I know last time we talked about Jesus uh, being a better covenant and how God made this covenant and Jesus being the guarantor of this, this covenant he made with us because uh, he was acceptable to God because he walked this earth sin free, he died on the cross for our sins and uh, rose on the third day. So he met all the qualifications that, that for the perfect sacrifice that we needed. Um, but I've learned something here as we kind of moved along. To have a better covenant, you the covenant has to be based on better promises or promises general. See, it's like kind of like our political system. We have candidates who, who run on a platform which generally is filled with better promises, right? Uh, so to, they'll act on our behalf if they get elected. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of times those promises are empty and no real change ever takes place. It's kind of sometimes why we're in the mess that we're in. Uh, I remembered a passage in 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 5, that, that I thought fit well here. It says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And then verse 6 goes on to say, Who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. See, Jesus has acted and been accepted as our guarantor, and now he still enacts on our behalf with better promises. Our scriptures today in our part four of Jesus is Better will be in, uh, in Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. And we'll start in verse 6, which starts off what Jesus is better with better promises. So please listen as I read Hebrews 8, verse 6. But as it, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. So in studying this, I realize that this, this better new covenant is filled with better promises. I, I have found four main promises made here and I, I would like for us to go over them. I hope you'll bear with me. This is a little longer video than normal. I'm just warning you up front. But I'll try to move through it, but I don't want to move through it too quickly because we can miss uh, what is very, very important here. The first promise is the promise of grace. Okay, we see that in our next three verses after verse 6, uh, 7 through 9 in chapter 8 of Hebrews. Please listen as I read that. For it is that first covenant, for if that, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9, Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, that being the old covenant, on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. So I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. One of the things we have to realize, especially in these passages today, the focus on this new covenant is, is on God's I will statements. And as you listen through the scriptures read today, listen, to, listen for the I will of God's statements here. We have to go back to the Old Testament to understand this fully about the promise of grace. In Exodus, when we read about Moses went up on the Mount Sinai and he spent time with the Lord and God gave him the law, the Ten Commandments, instructed him all about it. So Moses come down from the mountain and then he, he told the people. Well, they wanted to know what he said and God told them. Uh, Moses told them what God had said. And I want you to listen to what the people said in response to after Moses told them about the Ten Commandments and, and all that God had said. In Exodus 24, 3, it said, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the, word, the, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. As we know today, as we know, they did not obey God's words. 
It's one thing to say we will. It's another thing to do it, right? But the new, new covenant uh, doesn't, doesn't, does not depend on man's uh, faithfulness to God, but, but on God's faithful to his promise to man. Let me read that again. Let me say that again. The new covenant does not depend on man's faithfulness to God, but on God's faithful promise to man. See, God led Israel out of Egypt uh, the way a father would lead a child by his hand. You know, you think if you've led your child anywhere, you want them to hold your hand when you cross the street. He led them out of Egypt like that. God gave Israel his holy law for their own good, to separate them from the other nations and to protect them from the sin sinful practices of, of the heathen people. But the nation failed. That's why God said they continued not in, 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 my, in my new covenant, in the old covenant. That's Hebrews 8 and 9 we just read. God's response to Israel disobedient was to discipline them repeatedly. And finally, they went into captivity when, when they went into Babylon. See, God did not find fault with his covenant, but with his people. The problem is not with the law, but with our sinful natures. For by ourselves, we cannot keep God's law. We should, we should understand that already, but we cannot keep it. We learned in Hebrews 7, 19 a while back that the law made nothing perfect because it could not change the human heart. Only God's grace can do that. The new covenant is holy of God's grace. No sinner can become a part of this new covenant without faith in Christ Jesus. There's nothing you can do. As we learn, you can't earn it. There's nothing you can do. It comes by our faith in Jesus and for God's grace that we are accepted. Grace and faith go together just like the law and works go together. The law says put your faith in it, the law, then you have to live by it. So I put my faith in the law, then I am saved by the law. As long as I don't break it. How's that going for you? I know for me, I can break it hourly in my minds and thoughts and sometimes even in my actions. But grace says the work is done, believe and live. Now understand that this, this because this work is done doesn't mean we just get to live as we, as we want. There is a response. See, religion based in law following operates on the emphasis, I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. The basic operating principle of God's grace, the gospel and, and God's grace is, I'm accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. You have to listen to that carefully. Obedience for a Christian is always the goal. But the way of obedience is what's usually misunderstood. How do I obey the gospel of grace? You might ask. I know I ask all the time. Is to focus on how seriously God takes sin and how he can only save us at an infinite cost to himself. That's grace. Jesus died for us. That's God's grace. That's the only way this could work out for us. We will not be able to live in a selfish way or a cowardly way because of that grace. We understand it. We'll stand up for injustice and sacrifice for our neighbors. And we don't mind the cost of following Christ because we understand the price he paid to rescue us. That's God's grace. That's God's promise of grace. That Jesus enacted and is still enacting for us. The next promise I see here, promise number two, I guess you could say, is the promise of eternal change. And I want you to really listen to the I will statements in verse 10 here, because there's a bunch of them. Verse 10 of Hebrews 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, the law of Moses could declare God's holy standard, but it could never provide the power needed for obedience. 
If you if you live any life as a Christian very long, you know that. There's no power in, in just the law. Sinful people need a new heart and a new t- disposition within. And this is just what the new covenant people, the new covenant provides to us and to the people then. See, when a sinner trusts Christ, he receives a divine nature within. Listen to 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. See, the divine nature creates a desire to love and obey God. By nature, by nature, sinful people, we are sinful people and we're just disobedient. Listen, listen to listen to Titus 3, 3 through 7. For we ourselves, we were once foolish, disobedient, and led astray, a slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of our works done by, done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through, our, through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You need to go back and read those passages I just read and spend a little time on them. But the new nature gives us a gives each believer both a desire and a dynamic for a godly life. The law is external. God's demands were written on tablets of stone. But the new covenant, covenant makes it possible for God's word to be written on our human minds and our hearts. See, God's grace makes makes an opportunity, makes it possible for internal transformation that makes a surrendered believer more and more like Jesus Christ. It's unfortunate that many Christians think that they are saved by grace, but must then fulfill their Christian life according to the Old Testament law. Think about that. They want the New Testament for salvation, but the old covenant for sanctification. See, we do not become new. We don't become so, become holy people by trying to obey God's, God's law in our own power. It's by yielding to the Holy Spirit within us when we come to Jesus that we fulfill the righteousness of the law. And this is holy of grace. Holy. I, I can't do it on my own, and neither can you. The third promise here, which I think is interesting because I think a lot of times it's misunderstood, is the promise of forgiveness for all. This is found in verses 11 through 12. Please listen as I read. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest. Verse 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen? I already get one. See, there is no forgiveness under the law, because the law was not given for that purpose. It says in Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh be justified in, in his sight. For the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the law could not promise forgiveness for Israel, let alone for the rest of the world, including us. It's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that forgiveness is possible and to all who call on him. The Old Testament sacrifices brought a remembrance of sins, not a forgiveness of sins. In Hebrew 8, 8 11, he's just quoting Jeremiah 31, 34, and it refers to that day when Israel shall 
be you reunited with Judah and shall rejoice in the promised kingdom. In that day, there will be no more need for the, for, to share the gospel with others because everyone will know the Lord personally. Have you thought about that? However, until that day, it's both our privilege and responsibility to share the gospel message with, with lost people. That's what we're called to do. In verse 12, you ever thought about what does, it remember, what does it mean that God will remember our sins no more? Does that mean that all knowing God can actually forget what we have done? If God forgot anything, then he would cease to be God. The phrase remember no more actually means hold us against us no more. God recalls what we have done, but he does not hold it against us. He deals with us on the basis of grace and mercy, not law and merit. Amen? Once sin has been forgiven, it is never brought before us again. The matter is settled eternally. I've heard people say, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Of course you can't forget. The more you try to forget, you, the more you, you're just bringing the thing back up. But it doesn't mean that we have to forget. We have to learn to not to hold it against that person who has wronged us no more. We remember what others have done, we can treat, but we can treat them as though they never did it. We can do that through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus. That's how this is possible. It is possible because of the cross. For, for there, God treated his son as though he had done it, what we had done. Our experience from God makes it possible for us to forgive others. So if, you, if you're having trouble forgiving, forgetting, quit trying to forget and just keep asking God to help you in your heart to hold that against them no more. Now we're at our last promise. And this is just the order of the way it comes in the scriptures, but i I got something to say about this one. But it's in verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You ever realize that the old way of doing something was slowly going away? The way we stopped communicating, boy, has that changed? The tools we use are obsolete. You know, which would have been replaced with better, more efficient tools. That's what the Hebrew writer here, which I believe is Paul, is telling the people. You see, the old covenant was still governing the nation of Israel when this epistle was written. The temple was still standing and the priests were still offering their appointed sacrifices that we learned. Devout Jews probably thought that their, their Christian friends were lost their mind. Because they're th this solid religion they felt like they had because their faith was seemingly in something intangible. What the unbelieving Jew did not realize, and Jesus told them, was that their solid religion had grown old and was wasting away. It was, it was vanishing. And we know that because we have, we have the rest of the story at this point. In 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. And, they have, and the Jews have not had a temple or a priesthood to serve them since. See, the Greek word translated new means new in quality, not new in time. We, we, dis, we discussed at the, at the front of this, I thought this was a good way to put it, about how old things you know, are always replaced with new things, right? And usually once we get a new thing, we probably know in the back of our mind there's going to be a newer thing coming out. Take the iPhone, for example. I still have an iPhone 6, but what are we up to now? 11? An iPhone 11? That's always changing. New and improved. It's better. It's better. It works better. You got to get it, right? See, the new covenant is not like that. It is such quality. It is so good that it will never, ever need to be replaced. There's nothing better than what we're in right now. See, Jesus is ministering on the basis of a better promise that in the new covenant, by our faith and trust in him, he makes us partakers of this new nature. 
We are part of the new covenant that Jesus has promised. The new covenant can never get old and never will disappear. See, the, the promise of eternal blessing, I think, uh, is, is, is put last today, but I think most Christians think it's the only one and, and the only promise alone that they, that they pay attention to. It's like, I have become a Christian just so I can die and go to heaven. But as you see, the new covenant we are in, set in place by our high priest forever, is full of better promises guaranteed by Jesus. Blood is more than just promised heaven. It's a better promise of a better life now, not just when we die. We can live and trust in a promise now. We can love one another now. We can eliminate injustice between each other now, not by legislating it, by loving one another. Jesus said in, in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me, in, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, this is a summary of the climax of the, the upper room message. When Jesus, after Jesus had washed their feet, why did he give this message? So that the disciples might have peace in a world of tribulation. Note the contrast between in me and in the world. In Christ, there is peace. In the world, there is tribulation. This is the position we need to claim. We are in Christ and therefore... We can overcome the world and all of its hatred and all that's going out there, going on out there. Whether it be racial injustice, social injustice, economic injustice, just injustice in general should not be among Christians. This takes a deep heart level searching. When you see things on TV or you see someone and you have certain reactions in your heart, it takes a long, hard question and deep look at yourself to ask yourself, why? Why am I feeling that way? Why do these emotions come up? You know, Jesus didn't say when he returns, he meant right now. Yes, we all wait, wait eagerly for Jesus to return. I can't wait till he returns. Some days I can't wait till he returns. Trust me. There's days like that, whether it be just what I watch on the news and all the things that we're dealing with or just dealing with people in general. I wish he would come back right now. But while, while we're waiting, it's what we do in the hallway while we're waiting for those doors to open that are important. Do you want it now? Do you want it now? Do you want that? Do you have a relationship with Jesus but you're just feeling stressed out? Maybe you've just lost focus. Maybe we need to focus on the grace of God and what it took to save us. Maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you're in the sound of my voice, you never made that decision. You can make that decision. You can ask Jesus to come into your life, to give you a new hope, a new purpose, a new focus. You can do that. All you have to do is pray. And if you said that prayer and you're going to pray that, uh, let us know. Reach out to us at refugechurch.com. Uh, let us know that you made that decision. Any way that we can help with you, to walk with you, to continue in that. We would, we would love to be able to do that. We are a people who love the Lord, Jesus Christ, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we desire for you to know that, to know him as, as we are trying to learn and know him. Church, I hope to see you Sunday. Uh, Miss you guys. Miss everybody that's not been able to come because of the COVID-19. I pray that God eliminates that soon so we can be back together like we, like we should be, like God wants us to be. But in the meantime, work hard to stay in touch and stay connected to not only Jesus through his word and prayer, but also through communicating with one another in whatever way that works for you. Have a good rest of the day. And uh, I pray yours is uh, full of health, safety, and blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching today. And we'd love to hear from you. Just go to refugechurchnashville.com 
and you can find a contact card on our homepage um, that you can fill out digitally with prayer requests, with decisions that you've made, and even how to contact us. Just leave something in that comment box and we would love to pray with you, connect with you, and get back to you as well. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of Refuge Church Nashville. God bless.